you were to follow the conventional prescribed power progression that most manufacturers set out for you in motorcycling, you wouldn't experience much diversity. Sure, it might logically make sense for a rider to start on a Ninja 400 and then proceed to a ZX6 and then maybe a ZX10 many years down the road. Or maybe a Z400, Z650, Z900. Or MT-03, MT-07, MT-09. You get what I'm saying. Most motorcycle manufacturers have a tiered displacement category to give riders different flavors and different powers to stay within the same styling of the family. With the typical 400, 600, 1000 kind of thing that we've seen for the past 10 years or so, manufacturers give something for everybody. Beginners can jump into the 400s, intermediate riders get the 600s, and expert level riders go for the thousands. The manufacturer hopes that the beginner rider has a great experience with that brand and then wants to upgrade to the next motorcycle that makes them more power but stays within that same family of bikes. But as anybody who's been riding for a long time knows, it's a little bit more complicated than this. You might want to upgrade to a bike that's more practical or maybe provides a totally different type of riding experience. Maybe you want a motorcycle that actually can go off road a little bit versus your current street biased beginner motorcycle. Or maybe you want a motorcycle that prioritizes a characterful, unique experience over just literally making more horsepower and torque. Or maybe you started off too big and now you wanna go down the displacement ladder to learn a little bit more. So here's some ways you can make a worthwhile upgrade to your beginner motorcycle without just chasing more power. Look, most motorcyclists are eventually gonna get to the point where they're gonna want more than the 45 to 50 horsepower offered on tap from the vast majority of beginner motorcycles in the category today. Stuff like the Ninja 500, CF Moto 450 SS, all those sorts of motorcycles, for example. If you started on a small displacement sport bike and you love the fully fared look, and you wanna to commit to the sport bike life, maybe get involved with some track days and do some more serious twisty road riding. If your street riding is exclusive to ripping up canyons on the weekends, then the tried and true 600 category may be the best fit for you. But for the vast majority of riders, they're a little too laser focused. It's why manufacturers have been offering the new not so super sport category. They offer a cool blend of increase in power over the vast majority of beginner bikes, but still have nice enough street manners in a fully fared package. As opposed to a traditional four-cylinder screaming race bike like the R6 or the ZX6, these new not-so-super sports like the RS660, GSX 8R, or Yamaha R7 all offer a little bit more of a subdued and street-oriented riding style. And these motorcycles often have way less committed ergonomics, making them way more comfortable to ride than 600-class bikes. But I will say, I used to own a 600 class motorcycle for the street. I had a Daytona 675R for many years. I probably put on 25,000 plus street miles on that motorcycle. And yes, it was uncomfortable and yes, it was kind of stupid, but at the same time, I really enjoyed the experience. So don't always think that motorcycling needs to make the most sense. You're riding a motorcycle, it already doesn't make a lot of sense. But if you are thinking about doing something practical and usable and brand new, then the not so super sport category does have a lot more options. And the best news is if you're a beginner rider, you're not really gonna notice the difference too much over a super sport styled race bike and these new not so super sport motorcycles. You'll definitely notice them ergonomically, but you're not that in tuned yet. So it's not a big deal. And trust me, all of these new not so super sport bikes are gonna feel way faster than your current beginner bike. They make twice the horsepower in a lot of cases. So let's talk about naked bikes a little bit. Maybe you had a fully fared bike and you wanna to transition to a naked motorcycles. They offer a lot of the same benefits that I mentioned of the not so super sport bikes being in a more comfortable package and being a little bit easier to work on because they don't have fairings. And I think they look really cool. Some of my favorite motorcycles are naked bikes. The Trident True SV650, the newish MT-07s, the Trident 660s, there's lots of great motorcycles in this category right now. A bike that makes 70 to 80 horsepower is pretty great for the street. It gives you enough to play with, but not too much that you get in over your head. And for me personally, for the last seven years or so, I haven't owned anything as a street bike that makes anywhere over 100 horsepower. My Desert Sled made about 75, my new Aprilia Touareg 660 makes about 80, and I'm plenty happy with that. What's also interesting is that lots of riders start out on places like the SV650, the MT-07, and then upgrade through a totally different priority pattern for uh, getting a new motorcycle than the beginner on the super sport bike would. Because there's so many stories of riders starting out on like a Ninja 400 and then go to the stratospheric jump of jumping on something like an R1 
and then they quickly realize their mistake and that it's just not as much fun to ride such a ridiculously powerful motorcycle. Ultimately, a lot of those riders, if they don't crash out and hurt themselves, usually jump back down the displacement ladder and power ladder to something that makes a little bit more sense. So that's a common path I've seen on my time here on YouTube. Someone might get a small displacement sport bike, jump to an R1, and then jump back to something like an MT-07 or an MT-09, for example. If you want a fun, playful bike that's good at doing just about anything, a middleweight naked sport motorcycle is really the cream of the crop. I mean, think about something like an SV650. You can easily take it and have some fun on some twisty roads. You can commute with it. You could do a long distance trip with it. Bikes like in this category just make a lot of sense for a vast majority of riders, but a lot of them would require getting a windscreen, maybe hand guards, and that leads us to our next category of upgrading, going for a more touring oriented motorcycle. When you're thinking about upgrading your bike, a lot of times you're thinking about quality of life upgrades. And while you can add luggage and different windshields and bark busters and heated grips and tank bags and whatever else to your current naked bike or sport bike, a lot of times it is just simply easier and more fun, let's be honest, to get a new motorcycle that's already better at those things than modifying your current bike. Take it from me, I modified a scrambler to do all kinds of stuff. It is a lot easier to just buy the bike from the factory that's designed to do the job. So if you find yourself on your beginner motorcycle doing really long days in the saddle, enjoying yourself on long multi-day trips, you might be interested in getting a more touring oriented motorcycle. Maybe you don't chase power necessarily, you just get something that's a little bit better for that. What's fun about that is, let's say you started on a Ninja 400, it's just my example that I keep using in today's video, and then you end up going for a middleweight touring bike. Maybe you get a Yamaha Tenere 700 or an Aprilia Touareg 660 like the one that I own. Um, those bikes will make more power than your Ninja 400 and will be more exciting to ride from that perspective but they can also do a whole lot more other things that are more interesting to ride and provide a brand new novel experience for you to try out. For a lot of riders who have been up and down the power progression ladder, they usually end up on something practical and simple and playful enough to ride around on the daily. I mean, look at yours truly. A Touareg 660 is my personal motorcycle. 80 horsepower, adventure touring, it just does everything I need it to do, and I'm not that concerned about it. Other examples would include the Venerable Versus 650 that Ari Henning lovingly owns over off Revzilla. I mean, you see this clear pattern where people tend to this very simple, economical, practical motorcycle that can do a lot of things. And if your motorcycle is comfortable to ride, you're gonna wanna ride it more and you'll be able to experience more. So sometimes upgrading your motorcycle is about prioritizing the experience, not necessarily just power. Folks, I've given away over 53 motorcycles, valued at over half a million dollars in my time doing this whole crazy YouTube rigmarole thing. And this Ninja 500 SE is the new kid on the block. Make sure you check out yamynoob.com and become a member for your best chance to win. You'll rack up your entries to win and you can assign them towards giveaway bikes in the future or you can hold on to them and then put them towards your favorite bike that we do later on. We've got another really awesome spicy bike coming later for this year and next year we're gonna be doing all the latest and greatest newest bikes so make sure you're signed up and don't miss your chance. And the final frontier of this obviously is a Goldwing but I think the progression to get to a Goldwing is very different for a lot of folks. I think I've seen sometimes guys get sportsters and then end up with a Goldwing as their second motorcycle. I've seen guys resist the allure of a Goldwing for 30 years and then finally just cave and get a Goldwing. Uh, but it really depends on what you're trying to do with the bike. If you really are going to be crushing enormous distances, then getting something super specialized like a Goldwing could make sense. But for the vast majority of riders who still want to use their motorcycle to do other stuff, a comfortable sport touring motorcycle is really one of the most slept on options. You look at bikes like the Suzuki V-Stroms, the Triumph Tigers. I mean, there's so many great motorcycles in this category that make a lot of sense for riders. And that power progression and that upgrading ladder sometimes isn't as clear for people. And it can take people a little bit of time to come around to the idea. I mean, I thought adventure bikes were very dorky for a long time until I really understood what they could do. I still think they're a little dorky, but I don't really care anymore. Whatever, you know. Another difference for upgrading that I've seen people eventually get into is kind of going for something more premium, but not necessarily something faster. Most of the times it is, but it's just a different kind of like more retro charming experience. So example, that same rider on a Ninja 400, maybe they try out their buddy's Bonneville and they learn that they absolutely love it. And uh, the reason I bring that example up is because that actually happened with me. Uh, two years into my riding experience, I had an R3 and a Daytona 675. I got the chance to ride a Ducati Scrambler. 
And I just, I cannot explain to you guys how much I enjoyed the experience of riding the Scrambler so much that I eventually bought one myself because I just thought it was so cool and charming and unique. So sometimes when you upgrade, really you're just going to get a motorcycle that maybe has more character or pizzazz or charm. And the Triumph Bonnevilles are a great example. They're a more substantial, more expensive, more torquey motorcycle. I'd wager to say that's about as fast as a Ninja 500 in a straight line, but it's for the guy or gal who maybe is a little bit older and hasn't really thought about the fact that they just want to go as fast as possible and climb this power progression ladder, but rather would like something that just exudes a little bit more style, is a little bit more handsome, and maybe a little bit more mature in its execution. I think a lot of riders would even make this case coming from like a Suzuki to an Aprilia, or maybe you're coming from a Kawasaki to a Harley Davidson, or maybe you're just, uh, you know, like I was coming from a Daytona, spent a couple years off the bike back to a scrambler. I mean, it really can vary quite a bit. And sometimes as well, you can end up being in a situation where you're moving quite laterally. You know, you could see it as an upgrade because you want a different bike and a different experience. But let's say you're coming from a ZX6, then you're going to get a Ducati 848. Uh, those motorcycles are very close in performance and very close in what they're designed to do but they're gonna provide a very different experience. So don't think that every motorcycle you're gonna work through has to be better than the one before it. It could just simply be different and you just wanna try something new. Another interesting progression that I've seen with riders is adding to the stable. Now, I know that not everyone is fortunate enough to own multiple motorcycles and it's why a lot of us make do with just one ADV bike or one sport touring bike or one naked bike and we kinda just do everything with it. But a progression I've seen as well is people get a beginner bike they keep that beginner bike because it can be a commuter or do whatever, and then they add another motorcycle to the stable. Oftentimes, it's a motorcycle that's more specialized. Maybe it's a dual sport or an enduro motorcycle. Maybe it's a track-specific bike that is not registered for the road. And sometimes those upgrades can look very different and maybe not be as clear as you would think just because somebody is actually trying to do something very specific with that second bike. So honestly, no matter how you slice it, the power progression ladder by motorcycle manufacturers is a bit of a myth. There's very few riders that are gonna go MT-03, MT-07, MT-09, MT-10. Really what these manufacturers are trying to do is just offer a wide variety of power for different riders to maybe jump into the brand as an access point. You know, from the manufacturer's perspective, if you keep the kind of blade of availability of riders more open, more people can come into the brand at more entry points, right? You can have people at the top end trying to get an MT-10, but all the way down to the bottom end to get an MT-03 as well too. This is something Triumph's been doing for years, expanding their range. They got stuff like the Speed 400s, the Trident 660s, the Street Triples, and the Speed Triple 1200s. I mean, now that they've really expanded, who can come into the Triumph brand at whatever point? You've seen this with the Prilly and the RS-457 as well. But uh, I think it makes a lot of sense for the manufacturers to try to continue to keep people in the family if possible. But motorcycle riders are not all cut from the same cloth. Some of us are looking for something more comfortable. Some of us want dual sport capabilities. Some of us want adventure bikes. Some of us don't really care about power. Some of us went too far in the power and came back. So I'd love to hear from you about your power progression journey. Where did you start on? What bike did you get? Did you go back in the ladder? Did you change your path along the way? And where are you today versus where you started? Because for me personally, when I started out riding, I had a Yamaha R3. All I cared about was sport bikes. And now 10 years down the road, I have an adventure bike and my palette has become much wider and much more varied. So guys, I appreciate you checking out today's video on power progressions in motorcycling. I hope you learned something. I hope you could reflect a little bit on your own riding experience and I hope you have a great day. Thank you so much for watching today's video. I'll catch you guys in the next one. See you later. Wake up, you're dreaming, you're dreaming. Wake up, wake up, wake up. None of this is real, none of it's real. None of this real! Wake up! Keep watching Amy Noob.